Congratulations. And now we get to have a, um, uh, an impromptu, unscripted conversation. You can confirm for all of our guests that I haven't shared these questions with you. I feel like, like a game show host. Um, Are we going to do number two first? <laughs> Look, I, I think I would be tricking everyone if I, um, if I tried uh, to beat around the bush. Um, each of you was involved in different ways in our election campaign. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your, candidate didn't, your candidate did not win. <laughs> There's so a recount. <laughs> yeah. But let's say, in a moment of magnanimity, President Trump calls you up. And he asks you to the Oval Office. And he says, General, Admiral, let bygones be bygones. I want your advice on whatever you believe is the most urgent security issue facing our country. And I want your advice on what you believe is the most important security issue facing our country. Oh, and by the way, time is money. You only have three minutes. <laughs> John? Well, let me offer Admiral Stavridis the opportunity to start here. <laughs> um, first, let me uh, offer my sincere thanks to the Board of Trustees and the Board of Directors of the Washington Institute. I've I have a current affiliation with one of the think tanks in Washington, and I've had long affiliations with think tanks for some time in Washington. And I've heard it over, said over and over again tonight that uh, this is a moment in American history when the independent thought of organizations like think tanks are going to be essential to this new administration. Uh, but of all of them, I think the Washington Institute is going to play one of the most important roles in Washington in the years to come. Thank so, you. So thank you for that. Thank you for the leadership of the institution. Um, not because I've had a lot of involvement in this, uh, but I would say if we don't get the issues associated with the Middle East solved, we are headed for a great strategic crisis. It is both the most urgent uh, and the most dangerous uh, issue for us right now. Um, the Middle East peace, which I was personally involved in, uh, continues to be a, a problem for us. It cannot continue to fester. Uh, we have got to deal with this in this next administration. We have failed to deal with it properly to this point. Uh, there, was, there was the previous conversation about the four active civil wars that are underway in the region. Uh, there are strategic implications of those four strategic wars, uh, human humanitarian catastrophe uh, on an order we've not seen since the Second World War, which is fundamentally going to change the nature of the social fabric of Europe that has brought Russia in a nose-to-nose -nose confrontation with the United States that we have not seen that has empowered the Russians in a way that we have not seen uh, in any period of time since the end of the Cold War. Uh, if we don't deal with the issues associated with the extremism, uh, which is emerging, flooding out of that region as a direct result of those civil wars, uh, as you said very well, Rob, that it's a matter of the, the fundamentalists uh, and the extremists versus the moderates. If we don't deal with that, if we don't attempt to end those civil wars, uh, we have real long-term strategic issues that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, and there will be strategic impacts from that. And it, it is both the most urgent and it is the most dangerous to the United States. And it deserves our full attention right now. Okay. Thank you. So not to add overly to um, John's exceptional laydown of the Middle East, I'll give you two others that I think ought to be on the next president's radar. One is tactical and one is strategic. The tactical is North Korea. I think in many ways North Korea is the most dangerous country in the world. Why? We've spent a great deal of time working toward preventing Iran from gaining a nuclear weapon. North Korea has nuclear weapons, five, 10, perhaps as many as 15. 
they're increasingly able to deliver them at range, and worst of all, because leadership matters, they have a leader who is young, untested, untried, unpredictable, not irrational, but unpredictable, with a really bad haircut. <laughs> and we have no effective means of controlling him at this point. So I think that is gonna be a tactical decision that will land on the president's desk as those two vectors of nuclear weapons and means of delivery collide in the next 24 months. Strategically, people used to ask me when I was the NATO commander, and I, every single day that I was there, I loved working with my classmate, John Allen, in Afghanistan. What I really worried about, because I knew John would figure it out in Afghanistan, what I worried about was cyber and cyber security and our vulnerabilities in the world of cyber. I think that is the looming tower of our strategic vulnerability. Our electrical grid, our transportation systems, our financial world represented by this city, our health systems are immensely vulnerable. We will learn over the next 12 months the degree to which Russian engagement in this election mattered. We'll know more. These are huge strategic issues. So I would counsel a new president accepting fully John's assessment that the Middle East ought to be front and center. The tactical question over the next 24 months, I think, will be North Korea and the strategic will be cyber. Right? Uh, let me add to Jim's, because it's a really important point. The North Koreans have a tradition of strapping on new administrations Bang. To, to test them. Absolutely. Uh, we're, there's a complication right now, and that is that there's a very good chance that the South Korean president may resign. Exactly. She is completely admired in a corruption <laughs> scandal that has brought the government of South Korea uh, largely to a halt. So we've got some a very serious uh, crisis on the Korean Peninsula. So we could we could see not only that uh, government uh, collapse, but we could also see just as the new president is being inaugurated, the North Koreans strap us on to see what kind of juice this new president's going to have. All right. So um, uh, crisis in North Korea, our electric grid, financial system, and health system get destroyed. Um, waiter, <laughs> continue serving the wine. <laughs> All right, let me, I'd like to um, hone in on, on a series of specific questions. Um, I want to begin with, with Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jim, I want to start with you, sure. since uh, you had uh, every morning and every night when you woke up and went to sleep, you were thinking about Russia. I was. Um, now, in the region that we focus on most at the Washington Institute, the Middle East, um, perhaps the most significant strategic shift over the last year is the return of Russia as a key player. Absolutely. Um, now, Donald Trump has spoken of the need to improve relations with Russia. It's important to remember that when Barack Obama came to office eight years ago, same. he said exactly the same thing, the importance of improving relations with Russia. It didn't really work over the past eight years. Correct. Um, what lessons do we draw, and what advice would you give President Trump specifically on this. Is there a way to work with Russia? And what does he especially need to be concerned about as he tries to do that? I think there are three areas where we have to continue to confront Russia. Uh, one is their support for Assad, who is a dictator beyond the limits of what we've seen. John and I are old enough to remember the Balkans and look back at Milosevic. We've seen plenty of dictators in the long throw of our careers. Assad, in many ways, is the worst. So Russian support for Assad must be confronted. Secondly, their activity in the cyber world is absolutely unacceptable, and we have to confront there. And thirdly, the annexation of Crimea, which has extraordinarily, absolutely invaded and taken a chunk out of territory of a nation. We, we really haven't seen that, um, it, certainly in Europe anyway, since the end of the Second World War. So we have to confront Russia. 
in those three areas. However, there are many zones of potential cooperation with Russia. Counter-narcotics, counter-terrorism, Afghanistan, the Arctic, potentially arms control. Missile defense, I think, is some trade space. We have areas where we can cooperate with Russia. So my prescription would be confront where we must, cooperate where we can. And I would argue this is actually a zone where the art of the deal may actually be helpful. So I think this is one to have an open mind and see what could be constructed. But we must not, my view, yield on those three fundamental points that I mentioned. Very interesting. John, do you want to add anything? Well, I would say that the, the difficulty associated with Russia in Syria is, uh, is really a, a challenge for us now. Uh, when I was still the president's special envoy, we were watching the Russians begin their deployment into Syria. Uh, and we had had hopes that the Russians would do three things. Uh, first, that they would uh, partner with us in fighting the Islamic State, uh, which we called Daesh, that it would, they would partner with us in striking Daesh, that they would prevail upon Bashar al-Assad to reduce the, the suffering of the Syrian people, and that we would uh, work together with the Russians to begin a political process for the transition of Assad uh, out of office in Damascus. Uh, we didn't get any of those. Uh, and the Russians, of course, brought with them their own uh, coalition. The president was theoretically, our president was theoretically leading a coalition of 60 nations. The Russian coalition uh, was a coalition that included Iran, uh, Syria, uh, erstwhile Iraq, and then Lebanese Hezbollah, and then a large number of uh, extremist Shia elements. So you had Iran, which was the principal destabilizing influence in the region. You had Hezbollah, uh, which is the strategic threat to Israel. Uh, you had the Russians organizing this entity, which is, for all intents and purposes, uh, the coalition of the Shia uh, factors within the region so that uh, virtually any round that was fired by the Russians or any round that was fired by the regime was killing a Sunni or a Kurdish fighter in Syria. And sadly, our own government uh, negotiated away virtually all of its options that we could have had to provide support to the moderate Syrian oppositions. Uh, so the Russians today uh, recognized that they had the opportunity uh, when we chose not to act and not to support the Syrian opposition on the ground, they knew that while there is no opportunity to achieve the decisive outcome by military means, you can, dis you can achieve a political outcome by enabling it through military means, and that's what we're seeing today. That's the agony that we have seen, the humanitarian crisis. The, very likely, we'll see the fall of Aleppo within a couple of weeks because the Russians have upped the military ante. What we've been watching very closely, and Jim's made a very important point, is we can't see and we can't treat Russian activity in one place apart from Russian activity in every place. And so we have to, the relationship with Russia has got to include the relationship in Syria, the relationship as it relates to Crimea, the relationship as it relates to the eastern third of the Ukraine, which the Russians have, have effectively severed as well. Cyber. The, the, the major cyber incidents it's uh, destabilization of the eastern portion of NATO. We have to keep an eye on all of this, and we can't afford to uh, watch uh, any one part of Russia. We have to watch the entire, uh, uh, the, the enormity and the entirety of the Russian threat. And it is a threat. I don't necessarily view the Chinese as a threat, but I do, the Rus I do yeah. view the Russians as a threat. Yeah, you I both do. agree on that? I do. Um, you know, we haven't actually had this conversation, but, you know, Typically, people associate General Allen with Iraq, Afghanistan, the Middle East, Central Command. They associate Admiral Stavridis with NATO, Afghanistan, Europe. Actually, both of us, I think this is correct, have spent over half of our careers in the Pacific. That's right. We're both Naval Academy graduates. This is a maritime theater. We have both spent a lot of time thinking about East Asia in particular. And uh, I think we can manage our way through the relationship with China Absolutely. to avoid what is sometimes called the Thucydides trap of a cool. rising power, a declining power, et cetera. Um, I think it will require skill and diplomacy and common sense, um, but I think the elements are there to manage through 
perhaps more than some of the other things we've discussed. I don't, John, does that make sense? I, I, I do. I, you know, I, there's no reason why we won't probably have confrontation with the Chinese. Yes. But it, and we'll have competition yes. with the Chinese. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we won't have, yeah, uh, that we'll have to have conflict, that conflict is inevitable. Right. All right, uh, I want to ask you about uh, Syria you mentioned a moment ago. Um, I mean, if the term problem from hell applied anywhere, uh, <laughs> Syria would be the poster child. Sure. And I apologize for, for standing out from my moderator role to say uh, something that may not be politic, but I believe is true, which is the legacy of American inaction in Syria, I think will stay with us in this part of the world I for agree. many years to I, come. I agree, Rob. Um, but I want to ask you about the U.S. military and the issue of safe zones in Syria. The advice from the US military over the last number of years seems to have been, it's too soon, too soon, too soon, oops, too late. Now the Russians are here. What happened? I, you wanna start on that one? No, I mean seri seriously, because I think that's sure. unfair actually of the military. I think this is a political calculus, but I- It, it is. Yeah. We, look, we, uh, it's a very complex answer. Uh, the first question you have to answer uh, when, you, when you talk about safe zone, safe zone is typically considered the, uh, a uh, piece of ground, uh, but we often talk about the uh, no-fly zone, no fly zone or air exclusionary yeah. zone. Um, so the first question, as I would pose the question, I'd get the question, tell me about a no-fly zone. And my first question is, okay, look, we, we can build you the geometry of a no-fly zone. And we can enforce a no-fly zone. You gotta know, right now, the airplanes we have flying in Syria are there to bomb ISIL targets. It's not to dominate the airspace. Now, if you want us to do that, then we're gonna need more airplanes. We're gonna need more troops, we're gonna need a bigger base, but if you want us to do that, we're gonna need more troops, more airplanes. Uh, you've told us you don't wanna put any more into the region, but you want, us, you want an airspace uh, control. But you gotta answer the first question, that is, if a Syrian fighter enters that airspace, do we shoot it down? And if we do shoot it down, and the Syrians decide to defend that airspace with their surface-to-air missiles, are we now gonna attack their surface-to-air missiles and take them out? So look, we can do all of those things. Where do you want it to end? And if you don't want us to shoot down the Syrians if they go into the airspace, then don't have us do an airspace because it will mean nothing and we'll be discredited. But if you want us to go to war with the Syrians, we'll do that because we know how to put an airspace, a no-fly no zone or an air exclusionary zone. We can keep the airplanes out of the, the air exclusionary zone and we'll have to take out the integrated air defense system which controls the airspace and protects the, the uh, in that, at that time, the Syrian uh, airplanes. Once the Russians got in, they not only brought in frontline air superiority aircraft, they also brought in some of their very best surface-to-air missiles and a very sophisticated integrated air defense system. One we could defeat, but that's a different order of battle. So then the question becomes, why do we want an integrated, why do we want a, a, a no-fly zone? Is it to prevent the Russians from bombing the Syrians that we want to protect? Um, and if we can convince the Russians not to bomb the Syrians, why do we need uh, a no-fly zone? So it's a very complex answer. But the first question is, if the Russians fly in the no-fly zone, are we gonna shoot them down? If the answer is no, then don't have a no-fly zone. If the answer is yes, I can build it for you. But get ready for all of the second and third and fourth order effects. Because if you wanna to go to war with the Russians over Syria, we can do that for you, but you gotta decide. And what, what has happened here is we have consistently made a decision to do something, and then we sub-optimized the implementation, and we sub-optimized what we let the US military do when the time came to do it. And that really tied our hands in many respects. Yeah, I would agree with John that, again, as I said up front, this is not a military group of options uh, presented to the political leadership that said, hey, we want to do a no-fly zone or not. We're, we're kind of agnostic on that. Right. Um, we, we are your mechanics in this regard. You have to make the political decision. Um, and, you know, our track record isn't great at this. Um, go back to Rwanda, which is where a problem from hell came from, Samantha Power's book. 
uh, look at the Balkans where we were way late to need, yep. and here in Syria where we have been non-present. These are political decisions, but I believe in the responsibility to protect under international law when there is such an enormous failure of the international system that we owe a response. And not only for the moral and ethical reasons, but also for the pragmatic reasons that John laid out at the beginning. This is a region of extraordinary importance in which our principal ally, Israel, resides at the center. We cannot allow this to spin into a chaotic scenario. So I, I think we need a stronger set of political responses, and I hope we'll see that in the time ahead. Okay, thank you. Now, thank you. Let me ask you about one place where there are some American soldiers, um, <laughs> albeit technically in an advisory role, but they're, they're engaged. Sure. There's a country you know well, John, of course, in Iraq. Um, U.S. forces are helping local actors liberate Mosul, the second largest city in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, now, John, you helped build the coalition. Mm -hmm. you, helped, you supported this effort completely. We saw what happened a decade ago, almost a decade ago. We succeeded on the ground, decisions were made, and we saw ISIS emerge from the ashes. Yeah. How concerned are you about what comes after the day after we do liberate Mosul? And what do we need to put into place to make sure that we're not gonna wake up a year, two years, three years from now with son of ISIS, yeah. however terrible that may be? Again, a, an enormously complex uh, question. Um, Mosul is very complex political issue. Uh, you have Kurds north of the Tigris, uh, south of the Tigris, you have multiple Sunni tribes. You have the Iraqi security forces that are Shia dominated. You have Shia popular mobilization forces called the Hashtashabi, which were mobilized to fight Daesh alone. All of them are in this witch's brew of forces that are, that are taking back Mosul. That's not the problem. We'll take back Mosul. We will defeat Daesh uh, militarily. The problem with ISIL is that we, and this is now taking a huge step backwards and looking at this in a strategic sense. The issue is that we are not as, as a nation and we are not as a community of nations looking at the basic causal factors that have created the, the social, economic, political, religious causal factors that have radicalized hundreds of thousands of men and women around the world which give us this succession of extremist organizations one after another. Daesh is the lineal descendant of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq is, the, is a lineal descendant of Al-Qaeda writ large, which is the global network. The global network still exists. And as long as so many of these causal factors continue to persist and remain unresolved, we're going to continue to radicalize hundreds of thousands of men and women who will have no hope and have no alternative but ultimately to join these, these extremist organizations and we'll be fighting forever. So we'll defeat Daesh as an organization. But unless we ultimately, as a community of nations, take the steps necessary to resolve these basic underlying factors that radicalize so many people, we are doomed to fight forever. Now look for a moment at the, and the TWI the Washington Institute did some very good work on this on the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring had almost nothing to do with being Islam, uh, Islamic or Muslim. It had everything to do yeah. with having a complete absence of hope, yeah. incompetent governments, absence of inclusion, no human rights, uh, completely corrupt systems of justice, very little opportunity for economic prosperity, no access to education, and in one nation after another, it bubbled over and ultimately created an enormous uh, groundswell of uh, revolution and, and civil war fueled and accelerated by social media in a way we have never seen before. And until we're able to solve those problems, in the short term, we're going to be fighting forever. 
But in the longer term, if we are able to work with our partners and use the community of nations to mass our resources to do this, to begin the process of, of uh, solving the underlying factors that radicalize so many, we can begin to see our way out of the forest. Otherwise, we're going to be fighting forever. Every year, 129 million children turn 16 years of age. Most of them can't get a job. 90% of them are in the developing world. And until we're able to change that fundamentally, most of them will be absent of any hope, and they'll have very few options in governments that are basically corrupt. And we're going to see this continue forever until we're able to solve that. Meanwhile, Jim and I will be, and many of our friends and partners, many of the folks in here, our children will be marching off to war forever because we're solving or attempting to solve the symptom and we're not actually getting after the problem. Yeah, I agree with uh, John, and let me, let me pick up a thought, which is uh, two thoughts, actually. If you want to read a single book about the rise of ISIS, it won the Pulitzer Prize this year. It's called Black Flags by Joby Warwick, and it's a pretty good analysis of that plumb line you can drop from al-Qaeda global to al-Qaeda in Iraq to ISIS, Islamic State, ISIL, Daesh, whatever you want to call them. Um, so we need to understand more and learn more and build intellectual capital as we look at this. And really what you're seeing is terrorism 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and what will come is 4.0. And I agree with John, so often we want to play the hard power card. And there are times when you need hard power. We're not going to negotiate or create a jobs program to get rid of the Islamic State. But the long game, the long throw of history is on education, opportunity, creating a sense of shared progress exactly. in the social networks, which are the most powerful multiplier and bridge ever created. And I could show you a picture of Facebook globally, and it would be terrific. It's this marvelous world in which 1.6 billion people are connected. But the bad news is I would be showing you the command and control network of the Islamic State, That's right. where they are proselytizing, recruiting, and command and controlling. So to John's point, we have to live in that world. We have to own it as surely as we were able to own the battle space in Ramadi when General Allen was there conducting combat operations. And to conclude, people would say to me sometimes, yeah, you're right, Admiral, it's a, you know, it's a war of ideas. Not quite, it's a marketplace of ideas. We have to compete in that marketplace. And I think that's John's point over the long throw of this that is so important. Let me, let me add, the, the rise. You can clap, sure. <laughs> The rise of technology has vastly accelerated the capacity of these organizations. Yeah. Um, at 9-11 plus five years, I was in Iraq fighting Al-Qaeda. At 9-11 plus 10 years, I was in Afghanistan fighting the Taliban. At 9-11 plus 15 years, I was part of the coalition fighting uh, Daesh. 15 years, three different locations, three different enemies each one of them vastly more sophisticated than the next, each one of them technologically more advanced. The whole business is getting much more difficult because we are only, again, dealing with the symptom and we're not getting after the underlying causes. Okay. Uh, Admiral, what was your most difficult day as a commander? Uh, there were so many. Uh, <laughs> um, I think... Um, as I look back on it, um, the most difficult day, and John will remember it very well, was when John called me up and told me about the cross-border artillery strikes in Afghanistan that had um, killed many of our Pakistani colleagues. And I recognized at that moment that everything John had done so brilliantly for, you were there a year at that point, yeah, I think, yeah. right? And everything was trending in the right direction. And we had a series of mistakes on the, on the border between Afghanistan 
in Pakistan, and there were a s series of strikes going across, and it, it blew up the relationship with Pakistan, which in the end of the day is fundamental to how Afghanistan will come out, is this relationship with Pakistan. And it was a very hard day, and I remember simply being grateful that John Allen was our commander and that he was there because he was steady, he was informed, he was compassionate, and he knew what we needed to do next in an extremely uh, dark chapter in the four years I was the NATO commander. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> So, John, what was your most difficult day in command? Well, it was another phone call to him. Um, <laughs> it was about 3 in the morning, and I got a call from uh, Bagram, the detention facility. Yeah. Uh, and one of our, a couple of our troops had just set fire to 200 copies of the Quran in a trash pit. Um, one year earlier, this this reverend, so to speak, in Florida, if you'll recall, had burned one Quran. And the Afghans had dragged the UN mission from Mazari Sharif into the streets and slaughtered them all with butcher knives. We had just burned 200 of them in the, in the mission, in the uh, trash pit in Bagram. And I remember telling Jim, I, I thought this may be the end of the campaign. And by the end of the day, the streets of Afghanistan would run red with the blood of ISAF. Um, this was as close as I think we came uh, to a catastrophe within the coalition. And it took 24-hour-a-day uh, personal management. Uh, I had two of my officers assassinated in their office in one of the Afghan uh, headquarters. I went down to recover their bodies, but also to make sure that uh, the Afghan leadership knew that I was going to be personally involved in, in, uh, in seeing this through all the way. Uh, I mean, it, it was as close, Rob, as I have seen uh, anything uh, come to an end. But this was, a, this was a cultural issue. And I had to convince the Afghans. The Taliban immediately came out and said, this is really the face of the crusaders who have come to your country to defile your faith and to take your country. And I had to convince the Afghans this was a mistake and for them to trust me that it was, in fact, a mistake, that we, in fact, did honor the faith of Islam, we did honor Afghans, we did honor the government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. And because we did have a good relationship with the Afghan people, they did trust me. Now, we still had 45 people killed and hundreds wounded, but it would have been in the thousands, and the likelihood is we would have had Afghan military turning on us, and as it was, Afghan police and Afghan soldiers stood between us and hundreds and hundreds of Afghans who wanted at us. And we solved it. And I remember that phone call with Jim. I said, I think this, this might be it. This could be the end. Um, but, you know, we, we dove into the problem and we tried to solve the crisis and we did solve the crisis and we saved it. And my first, my next call was to Karzai and told him, for God's sake, do not say anything until I can get to the palace and talk to you. Because it was his condemning us after the burning of the, of the Quran in Florida that caused the knifing of the UN mission in yeah. Mazari Sharif. So, um, so gentlemen, when I when, yeah. In my first question uh, earlier, I made this distinction, uh, which neither of you picked up on, but that's all right. This <laughs> distinction between uh, the urgent and the important. Mm -hmm. um, in the Middle East. Some would argue that this is a distinction between ISIL, ISIS, and Iran. Namely, we can defeat 20,000, 30,000 uh, jihadis in control of Raqqa and Mosul, and we, can, we know how to do this, but a state with tentacles and influence throughout the region, that's a much more serious long-term challenge. Um, what advice would you give incoming President Trump on how to deal with a state that says it wants to join with us in fighting against Sunni jihadists, 
but is itself a source of great regional tension, great regional instability, and I'm referring to Iran. Yeah, I, I think we partner very closely with the Sunni states that will work with us, because in the end, the Sunni jihadists, the Sunni extremists are as great a threat to the Sunni states uh, as they are to us. We partner with them much more closely. We drew back from them. We left them, and I've been in their offices a lot, and just recently, we left them with a real sense of abandonment. Uh, and they're ready to partner with us, and they're ready to partner with us in ways to stabilize the region. Uh, and I think we partner with them a lot more, not just to deal with the, uh, the Sunni extremists, but also to deal with the Iranian threat, because the Iranians are a threat in the region. They are the principal destabilizing threat in the region. And you can just go right around the map, uh, and whether it's in Syria, where they uh, are one of the, they are, are if perhaps beside the Russians, the key threat. There are large battles that are fought uh, in Syria where there aren't any regime forces at all. It's Hezbollah and IRGC Goods Force advisors that are, that are the only fighting forces in the entire battle. Uh, or in Iran, uh, or in Iraq, where uh, the Iranian forces are supporting uh, elements of the uh, Iraqi forces. Or in Yemen, where the Iranians are supporting the Houthis. Uh, or in other places throughout the region where uh, the Iranians have the stabilizing influence. So we partner with the Sunni uh, uh, allies and uh, traditional friends uh, to contain the uh, Sunni extremist elements, and we also partner with them in the containment of the Iranian destabilizing influences as well. Because if we do that, we also provide for the security of Israel. From my perspective, that's got to be job one for us. Yeah, and I would, I would just add, agreeing with all that, that... Um Israel really is central to this. If you look at the capability, the intelligence, the cyber, the war fighting ability, um, w we will never have a better partner central in that region. So I think the interesting thing to contemplate here is the relationship of Israel and the Sunni states going forward. I, I would not rule out the idea of a condominium of sorts opposed to Iran, and that's a couple of turns of the wheel away from us. But at the moment, we, we need to partner with the Sunnis, as John says. We need to reinforce what we're doing with Israel, and we've got to close in on Iran with intelligence, cyber, and special forces as we go forward. This is a generational challenge we face with Iran. Can, can I just ask both of you a very specific question, because there's so much... Um, uh, 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 um, I think misinformation out there on this issue. Um, in your experience, has any Arab leader, any local Arab general, any local Arab military leader ever said that, in, that they won't cooperate with the United States because of America's friendship with Israel? Um, you know, I've had a pretty interesting... Uh, exposure to this, and I worked very closely at the ground level with the tribes, all the way from the Syrian border down the Euphrates to Baghdad, and then, of course, all of the Iraqi military leadership and much of the Sunni Arab leadership in the region. Um, never. Not one. Exactly. Let me, and now, not only turn it over the other way, um, most of them, most of them, when no one is listening, will also tell you, if it wasn't for Israel, the region would be in much worse shape, that Israel is the cornerstone of stability in the region, and they're very thankful for that. Yeah, and I agree. I agree. I think um, as you uh, motor around the region these days and you look at Egypt, you look at Turkey, you look at um, the, the Gulf states, there is a... <laughs> a growing appreciation for that point, the stability of Israel, the connectivity to the United States, right. and the threat of Iran. Look at what Iran is doing in the region. It's Yemen, it's Damascus, it's Iraq, it's Syria. It is an utterly destabilizing force, drawing the Russians into this orbit, and laying on top of this, this ancient Shia-Sunni religious split, which 
kind of vaguely resembles the wars of the Reformation. If we are going to succeed in creating more of a stable peace there, it's going to have to be with Israel central and trying to overlay the Sunnis on top of this. And I think we can do that, to your point, Robin, to John's point. And the relationships are actually quite good. They are. And they're, although they're quiet, they're actually quite good. Yeah. And, and we should also mention in this context Jordan, which um, continues to be a force for good in this concept. So I only have two questions left. And, I, uh, but first, and first, I want to ask you, Admiral, about, Admiral, about something that um, General said earlier, which is difficult, I think, for Americans to hear. Mm -hmm. And I want to get your view on it as sure. well. Uh, General Allen said that chances are likely we will be fighting in the Middle East as far as the eye can see, mm. as long as we can imagine. Yeah. Do you think that's, that's the case? I, I think we will be engaged in the Middle East for the foreseeable future. I do not think, and I doubt John thinks, we're going to end up deploying 150,000 troops as we did to Afghanistan under our command or 170,000 troops to Iraq. Um, but I think the chances are extremely high that we will remain engaged militarily at the level of 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 troops. Um, the key to success, the keys are two. One is the ability to which we can create coalitions, partnerships, alliances, which John led so well in his role as a presidential envoy. And the second is the degree to which we can uh, leverage technology so that we don't have to deploy 100,000 troops into the region using intelligence and cyber, some of the things we've talked about. If we do those two things reasonably well, we will be engaged, there will be combat, there will be conflict, but we will do it in a more effective way, I think, than we have over the last decade. Let me, can I make a point? I think what I said was we're going to be fighting extremists for the foreseeable future, not necessarily in the Middle East. Um, I built the taxonomy for how to understand ISIL. And ISIL is really a three-headed dog. Uh, the traditional, what we call core ISIL, is that entity that exists in Iraq and Syria. The second is what we call the distant provinces, or wilayats, that exist in places like Libya and the Sinai and the southern portion of the Arabian Peninsula, in other, many other places. And these provinces are now hotbeds of extremist activity. Some existed already. Some have increased in, in uh, virulence. Boko Haram is one. Abu Sayyaf and Mindanao are others. And we're going to have to deal with those for some period of time. Those extremist elements, we're going to have to fight. And when I say fight, to Jim's point, our special operators are going to be dealing, against, dealing with those for some period of time and doing it by empowering the nations to deal with it themselves. Because you defeat an indigenous extremist organization by using the indigenous forces themselves. That's the best way to do it. But the third head of this ugly animal is the global network that has emerged that is going to be with us for a very long time. And it rides on the back of the Internet of Things. And it rides uh, on the back of the commercially available end-to-end uh, -end encrypted uh, communications systems uh, that have seen the fruits borne out in places like Belgium and Paris and in Denmark and other places. And this, this global network is the manifestation of the extremist network that we're going to be fighting for a very long time. And until we turn our attention to that global network, we're going to have a problem. And we've got to really turn our attention to it. So it's cyber, it's high technology, uh, and it is under so, social networks. Uh, that's correct. Um, and social media, it's all of that. Yep. And until we really turn our attention to this, and we really haven't, yep. uh, we're, this is the extremist capacity of the future. We're going to beat these guys on the ground in places like Mosul and Raqqa. It just is going to happen. And we're going to beat them in places like Libya and the Sinai. Israel and Egypt are doing a very good job, and they'll take care of them there. 
it is the global network, ultimately, that is the great challenge to us today. Yeah, can I just give you an image, which is that we are very good at launching missiles. We can conduct lethal combat operations all day long, and we're very good at that. We need to get better at launching ideas. That's how we're going to succeed in this one. You know, you know friends, I, I, I do hope you all just sit back for a minute and appreciate the master class in global strategy <laughs> that we're all benefiting from with Admiral Stavitas and General Allen. All right, so let, let, let me just pose my last question. Um, and it goes like this. I'm going to give each of you a magic wand. So after careers in service of our nation, you've seen great things. And I'm sure, well, you've seen things that weren't so great. If you could fix, correct, or repair something, something about our military, something about our political system, something about our decision-making process, something that you've experienced along the way, and wave that magic wand and fix it, what would that be? Beyond the very unbalanced Army-Navy? Uh, yes. <laughs> foot, football game? Okay. I'll go first. Um, yeah, I would, uh, I would get rid of the height requirement at the Naval Academy. <laughs> yeah. um, I think the thing I would change immediately, which I did just get over, um, the thing I would change in all seriousness, and I, I think we'd probably all agree with this, is this sense of gridlock in our political system. And, you know, John and I are old enough to remember when our parties could work together, our branches of government could work together. I, I think in today's environment, it's so poisonous, and we become so oriented toward the extremes that that idea of being a centrist, that idea of finding compromise, that idea of overcoming gridlock, um, has left us, and that worries me deeply. And if I had a magic wand, I'd somehow wave it over <laughs> the swamp that must be drained <laughs> <laughs> and create a sense of shared responsibility for all of our futures. Okay. John? Um, you know, recognizing with whom I'm speaking tonight, this is, this is, I promise you, I'm not pandering to the crowd, but I was eye deep in this personally now twice. And if I could, because I have seen where it could be successful and I have seen how utterly essential it is uh, to the future of the region and to the future of a people, if I could wave the wand mm -hmm. and achieve Middle East peace, that oh, would be sure. my Absolutely. objective. Okay. Yeah, I believe it is attainable. And I believe it has to be attained, and that's what I would do. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Admiral James Stavridis and General Thank John you. Allen. Thank you. This Thank you. year's Thank you. Scholar Statesman. <laughs>